activities. <coughs> Distinguished participants who have come for this lesson region law teachers conclave. Once again, thanks to Manupadra for initiating this uh, dialogue. But we have with us today Sri Lalit Basin, Dr. Lalit Basin. In fact, many universities wanted to confer doctorate on Sri Lalit Basin for his contribution to the legal profession and legal education. It's, it's really a great opportunity that though I have been talking with the uh, Dr. Lalit Basin at multiple occasions. But this conversation that what I am going to have with Dr. Lalit Basin is on your behalf. I don't think uh, many of us are, I don't think any one of us have been born when Dr. Lalit Basin started his legal profession. I would request all the audience to give a big round of applause that he has completed 61 years of service in the legal profession. I have a standing ovation for someone who has served the legal profession for almost 61 years now. Not as a law teacher, but as a lawyer. He has trained multiple lawyers, multiple legal professionals. And uh, I know that at some point of time, there were four judges of the Supreme Court at the same point of time who were his juniors. And even today, we have some of his juniors adorning that highest office in India. So we have uh, the pleasure of having Dr. Malik, Malik Basin with us. Sir, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and for being with us. <coughs> Sir, my first question to you. Before you ask me any questions, <laughs> uh, all of you would have heard, seen, viewed, coffee with Karan. <laughs> so, this is my opportunity of coffee with Professor Shanta Kumar, who, as he rightly said, he's here on behalf of all of you. So I'm having a coffee with all of you while sitting here. Thank you, sir. Sir, my first question to you, sir. Uh, you enrolled in the year 1961, 62, uh, and you must have had your law education during that time, before 62. And I know that you have been very closely connected with law teaching institutions in various capacities and uh, as law teacher, sir, I, I must confess that the law teachers community is extremely grateful to you for initiating the law teachers day, law teachers award function, which Dr. Lalit Basin initiated and he does it every year except for the last few years. No other uh, institution honors law teachers except uh, uh, the Silk uh, Fund and Dr. Lalit Basin. Because of your long connections with the law schools, sir, can I request you, sir, to tell you what kind of transformation you had seen personally since your days as a student of a law school until date? What is the transition that you have seen? Yeah, before uh, answering your very relevant question, I would like to put on record two things which are my observations as a result of the presentations made in the inaugural session. I can tell you with some daring certainty that Indian legal profession is second to none in the world. And again, I can tell you with some daring certainty that 
the Indian legal education is also second to none. We may not have those big resources you see, which are available to the uh, developed countries, universities and law schools, but we have stood the test of time. Our law schools are playing a very, very pivotal role. And when I talk of law schools, I'm not talking about those, some schools, you know, we just sell out the law degrees. There are hundreds of them spread all over, you see, the country, and the Bar Council has not been able to do anything about that. But I'm talking of genuine bona fide law schools which are there and which are represented here by your presence. You are all distinguished law teachers here who are, and I can say that Indian legal education has put the test of time. Yes, new topics, new subjects, new laws keep on coming in. Therefore, you have to keep pace with that. And that, I think you are adapting, the law schools are adapting. The information technology act came, you see, they, in late 90s, uh, we had the new arbitration act, then mergers and acquisition laws, everything has been undergoing a change constantly, but you have adapted, you see, to that. And law has not changed. Legal education has not changed, you see, since the time I was a student. We have very steadfastly committed ourselves to remain a profession and not become a business. So that I think the law teachers must always keep in mind. Don't convert, don't let your students, you see, convert this uh, very noble profession into a business as has been done in many, many Western countries in, in Australia also, where you can form companies which are listed also in the stock exchanges and they are called the law firms. I don't want to see that day in India. I want this to remain a profession. When I started, we had the same laws, whether it was the Civil Procedure Court, the Contract Act, you see, Limitation Act, and same criminal laws, IPC, CRPC, Evidence Act, and then of course the Contract Act. So many laws were there which still continue to be there. Therefore, when I say that we have stood the test of time, the laws remain relevant. And these laws are now like an integral part of our constitutional framework. That is, Another area of debate, whether this system of administration of justice is suitable for India or not. But I don't want to go into that because I have very firm views on this, that this adversarial form of the system of administration of justice, which we have inherited from the British, is not a part of our culture, our tradition, our heritage. It was never there. We had the heritage, you see, of consensual form of delivering justice. We had the Gram Panchayats, Panchayats, and then we had the Zilla Parishads and all that. Even during the Mughal times, people know it, they have heard about it. Adle Jahangi, Adle means justice. Jahangi is justice. Emphasis was always on justice. but. When the British came in, they brought in these laws, which are, as I said, now a part of our constitutional framework. We can't do anything about it. But our constitution says that we, people of India, have to secure to ourselves justice, economic, social, political. There is no mention of law. But what has actually happened is that the emphasis has shifted from justice to law. Law and justice are two different things. 
law can only be a tool to provide justice. It cannot be a substitute for justice. That is where we have failed. And that we have failed in the sense our constitutional uh, founders, constitution founders, they were aware of the element of justice. But at the same time, no care was taken to introduce, you see, system of administration of justice. Education has remained the same. New technologies have come, whether in the law schools also, or there is, as the Dr. Shashi Kalagurpur also said, hybrid system and all that. But technology can only be used as a tool it cannot become, you see, a total substitute for legal education. Legal education has to remain the same. Technology only facilitates the learning process, the research process, making you, making to you available at the drop of the hat, you see, what you want uh, to know the case law or natural justice. You want to know the case law on uh, criminal law, you see that uh, rapes and deportees and other things. You can get all the case law thanks to in innovative efforts of uh, Manupatra and other institutions. But emphasis, now, what sort of justice we are giving to our citizens of this country? I think that is very relevant because that should be the focus of legal education because you have to train the students to be lawyers. It is admitted fact, five crore cases are pending all over the country. And I was sharing the platform as I'm doing today, but there were other speakers also with the Chief Justice of India. And the Chief Justice of India was boasting of the fact that they have facilitated, you see, the filing, the digitization, they are having now uh, virtual hearings and all that, he said. So when my turn came to propose a vote of thanks to him, I said, sir, that is all right. You have facilitated the filing that is good for the litigants that they don't have to run about here and you see do all that, do filing and all evidence, affidavit, every procedural thing has been facilitated. What about the disposal? Can technology dispose of the cases? No, it will make you ready to come to certain conclusions. But the disposal will come from here. It will not come from any type of technology. And if you facilitate only one part of it, that is filing of cases, this arrears of cases will become, you see, about 10 crores. Everyone will be filing cases, but what about the disposal? No attention has been paid by anyone with regard to disposal. That is where, if at all, technology has to play a role what technology can do for the disposal of matters, not use of artificial intelligence, because that has totally failed so far as the disposal is concerned. There have been judgments which have been subsequently overruled because they had applied AI, you see, to come to certain conclusions. That is, that is not. Each case, I think that is the law in India, each case has to be decided on its own facts. And facts are different in each and every case. Therefore, there has to be an application of mind. That is where no tool of technology or artificial intelligence will help you. And very recently, Rishi Sonak, you see the Prime Minister of UK, he came up with a very strong statement after the Blackley uh, Declaration in London about four or five days ago about the hazards of artificial intelligence, about what, you see, it can play sometimes havoc 
with you see the uh, type of life that we are leading. So now there is a conscious awareness, and that declaration is signed by India also, very recently. So it, you have to become conscious of the perils of you see AI. It certainly, in my view, it cannot be applied so far as the legal education is concerned, or so far as the uh, administration of justice is concerned. So the laws have remained the same right from the time that I was practicing, and evolution of law has been there through the Supreme Court judgments, High Court judgments, which is a very natural phenomenon. Therefore, that evolution is a very healthy sign of growing jurisprudence in different aspects, in different fields of law. So nothing has changed so far as the system of education is concerned. But tools may, there may be more tools now. I, uh, the students can do their own research. They can, you see, go to various uh, research tools and find out for themselves. But whenever I visit a law school, and I've made it a practice to go to at least two law schools every month, I've been invited by them. I always tell them that yes, use this technology, but always remain convinced that there can be no substitute for a law teacher. Law teacher will always remain a very relevant guide to you and help you in your profession. So, I'm sorry, I did the wrong word. No, no, no. Sir, sir uh, <coughs> thank you for uh, making this statement that nothing has changed. This is what is the hypothesis that we wanted to prove, that in legal education, so far, nothing has changed. It's not reflecting the changes, what exactly is happening. Uh, I'm, I'm also happy, sir, that you correlated uh, law teaching with the uh, the uh, transformation what's happening in the justice delivery system. It's, it, it's, it's said that uh, in an adversarial trial, both the plaintiff as well as the defendant knows the truth. It is only the judge who is on a trial. <laughs> both the parties know the truth and ultimately. Sir, I, I see that in the legal profession, uh, there is some change happening from adversarial litigation to dispute resolution to alternative dispute resolution through arbitration mediation and now uh, the focus is more on dispute avoidance by many law firms getting into the work of doing due diligence to ensure that there are no litigation, there are uh, no dispute instead of uh, resolving disputes, it's better to avoid disputes. So I see that there is some level of uh, uh, transformation which is happening in the legal profession. What, what is your opinion, sir, that how law teachers should get into a continuous mode of learning uh, to reflect these changes, what's happening in the legal profession? So what do you think should happen in legal education in the future, at least in the coming decades? You see, as I said, that the system of administration of justice has virtually broken down so far as the Indian citizens are concerned. Our Supreme Court is busy in disposing of matters, you see, of the election, electoral bonds, and you see other uh, uh, mandir cases on the caste system, other things, Supreme Court is seized up also. But the cases of the ordinary citizens, they are not getting see, any relief from the courts. Therefore, by sheer force of circumstances, one had to think of the alternatives to litigation. People thought that arbitration could be an effective tool. Now, arbitration is not open to common person. Arbitration means big corporate fighting you see disputes and going for arbitration and spending much more money you see than what even litigation would cost by having our uh, honorable retired judges you see as uh, arbitrators and former chief justices and judges 
and they uh, they charge such hefty fee, arbitration fee. I have had the experience that for one day's hearing, it is split into two parts, pre-lunch and post-lunch. So one day is converted into two hearings, which makes the, you see, the uh, arbitration process very expensive and prolonged because their diaries are full. They will give you date after six months. And if it is a tribunal, you have to see the convenience of all the three members of the tribunal, whether it is suitable. So arbitration also, despite various amendments and despite the time frames which have been put now, it has failed to take off in India. So what is the answer? As I said, we have to go back to our heritage, our, you see, ancient system of consensual form of administration of justice, which suited a country like India, such a populous country, but we did, we, we, the uh, British people, the British rulers at that time, they thought they could have the luxury of having two, three tier system, uh, starting with the lowest court, then going to the upper, then going to the high court, and eventually leading up to the House of Lords. Now, now they have the Supreme Court also there. It suited a small country like UK, but it never suited a country like India. Therefore, the answer is samjhata. Try to settle the disputes. And that is where the responsibility of the law school comes in. And I have been saying it, you see, <coughs> advising the law school to have something of developing negotiating skills among the students by having some disputes which are sent for moot mediation. Have those fake, you see, events to uh, harness, you see, the skills of people to settle the dispute. Now, supposing there is a dispute between two big corporate bodies, <coughs> the general counsel of one should be talking to the other, trying to resolve the dispute and they can negotiate, they can discuss. That will be the answer. However, this new mediation law will also not help. Actually, for mediation, you don't need any law. You need a change of mindset. And that mindset cannot be brought about by law. <coughs> so despite this new, you see, act coming in, it is not going to ease unless there is a change in the mindset of people that we must try to settle our disputes and that is where the law schools have to take the lead by firstly emphasizing the need for settlement of disputes among the students because that is our culture and I am not comparing ourselves to other countries, you see. They have different culture altogether. In India we have a different culture so far legal profession is concerned because of the heritage of the father of the nation the first Prime Minister of the country, the first President of India, the first Deputy Prime Minister, Sardar Patel, Dr. Ambedkar, they were all lawyers who have contributed significantly, you see, to the, not only to the growth of the profession and nobility of the profession, but also to get independence for us. And that role has continued. Some of the eminent people have been there as cabinet ministers, whether it was Mr. Chidambaram or Mr. Arun Jaitley or Vishankar Prasad or people who are holding such important positions. That is the role that you see our profession has played. And that role has to be continued. And these very big names which I have quoted to you along with the names of such eminent who whom I consider my mentor, that is Pali Nariman. I consider him to be my mentor because although the age difference is only 10, 12 years, but I have learned a lot from him. So that would be in line with what even Professor Madhav Menon <laughs> was a great friend of mine and he was known as the father of modern legal Indian uh, legal education who set up the National Law University 
I was like a founder member of the uh, Bangalore University. This is, he never wanted to see the system to be substituted by another system, system of legal education. He only wanted the system to be improved. That is, technology to come to the aid of the existing system not to become a substitute, you know, for the existing system. That is the difference, that is what he was propagating. And we have had that excellent relationship for more than 20 years when he came to Delhi also. So, that developing the negotiating skills and trying to settle the disputes, I think that is the prime need of the hour. If lawyers have to do their duty, they should forget the fact that they may not be earning fee. If the disputes are settled, then who will come to lawyers? No, people will still come to lawyers in order to know whether they should enter into settlement, they should not enter into settlement, whether they should go for mediation, who should be the mediator. The legal advice would still be required. Therefore, you will not become irrelevant. You will remain relevant, but in a positive manner. Rather than promoting litigation or arbitration, your emphasis should shift. And that is my appeal to, you see, all of you faculty members, to inculcate this among the students, the spirit of samjhauta, settlement of disputes, which can only be possible through mediation. Thank you, Robert, sir. Uh, in fact, uh, you highlighted two very important points. One is that uh, the present generation of law students in the classroom need to be trained on the new 21st, the 21st century skills, which you mentioned negotiation skills and various other skills. You highlighted that uh, that, that uh, skill sets needs to be imparted to the present uh, generation of students in the classroom. That is one thing. Second is, uh, you wanted the law teachers to look into the history of justice administration in our country and see that if we can innovate and come out with some indigenous form of uh, justice administration. I will not even say dispute resolution, sir, it was justice administration. So uh, these are two very important things that uh, I could uh, uh, learn from you answer to the, my previous question and therefore I am sure that uh, the law teachers assembled here will take note of it and they will start acquiring these skills themselves so that they can go and impart these skills to the students and I think that should be the focus of our next conclave where we should be focusing more on the 21st century skills and how these 21st century skills should be taught to our students in the uh, law schools. You mentioned a very important point, whether we should treat ourselves, you know, as a separate uh, system of administration of justice. That is very relevant because in the previous inaugural session, references were made to foreign lawyers coming and they are doing everything. That is my next question. No, yeah. That's my next question. No, what I wanted to say was that foreign lawyers, at least for the time being, they are not coming because the Bar Council of India has kept their own rules in abeyance because we as Society of Indian Law Firm have been opposing the entry of foreign lawyers but since 2014 we have taken a consistent stand and let foreign lawyers come here. We are ready, you see, for facing uh, what I call competition that is cooperation and competition. We are fully equipped now. Indian legal profession is fully equipped to meet all these challenges from foreign lawyers. But what they will bring is something not connected with profession, but they are converting it into a business, a regular business activity, which will dilute, tend to dilute, you see, the nobility of the profession which in India we have inherited. That should be retained. That was, for the, that was precisely the, the 
last question that I wanted to ask you, sir, before leaving the audience to ask a few questions to you. I need to use your mic. So they have given the best mic to use. The idea is they, should, they don't want me to ask many questions to you. I think. Sir, uh, this uh, issue relating to the entry of foreign lawyers and law firms for practice in India. So, what is your advice for the law teachers? Uh, how do they, uh, how should they need to prepare themselves to face these challenges? And what they need to do in their classrooms to prepare the law students to equip themselves to face these challenges? I don't think they need to do anything. What the foreign lawyer, when they come to India, they need to do something. They have to learn, you see, about the Indian law, Indian practices, including Indian birth culture, our court systems, our, you see, uh, uh, laws regarding uh, corporations and all that. They have to learn something. I think we are already on the right track. Whatever contemporaneous developments are taking place, I think the Indian law schools and Indian legal profession are fully aware of all those. Whether it is competition law, it is the laws of mergers and acquisition, whether it is IPO, making investments and all that, I think our legal education and legal profession has kept pace with these contemporaneous developments. So I don't think any shift is required. I think we should stick to the basics of our legal education. Yes, introduce technology for disseminating more and more information. That's all. But not as a substitute. And that is what Manupatra is doing. And that is what I read very recently. I think it was in Times, uh, Economic Times or somewhere, where there's a new portal offers online lessons in law. That is what Manupatra has started. Let me read out one passage, it's very relevant. It says the uh, law skills, law skills, this portal exclusively is dedicated to law education and provides courses for teachers, students, practicing lawyers, and spread awareness among general people in English, Hindi, and several, several regional languages, including Marathi, Tamil, Telugu, Bengali, Kannada. And Mr. Deepak Kapoor, founder, he said, law education in India is not up to date. There is a need to train teachers as well, especially about the new laws, including GST, data protection, and laws. First part of it, I don't agree with Mr. Kapoor that legal education is not up to date. I think it is very much up to date. Our law schools have not failed in that respect. But second part, I agree that there is a need to train teachers, especially about new laws. About new laws, of course, they should be familiar with. And there should be like uh, not only continuing legal education for lawyers, but also for judges also. And for law teachers, they can continue to have this. Continuing legal education is a very relevant tool which should be applicable to all the stakeholders in this legal profession, that is the law schools and the lawyers and the judges. Most of our judges don't know about data protection law. They don't know anything about it. We had to organize, you see, some uh, special lectures for them. We don't call them that we are training the judges or we are uh, telling them what they don't know about. Therefore, we have to say some experts are visiting, so they make them familiar with that. So that is the, I don't think any drastic change is required. But no. I, I could understand that there is a big opportunity for the law schools now to train foreign lawyers. Yes. Yeah, on the Indian law. Of course. I think we should be yes. the first university to start some programs. Yes. Why not? Yeah. No, and then students are coming. You see, we in Society of Indian Law Firm, we have an exchange program where we send students, for instance, to Pennsylvania Law School. 
and those students did not find any difference in the standards of legal education which you see they were studying in the law school in India and in Pennsylvania law school. But the Pennsylvania law school student who came to India, they found that there were certain uh, innovative ideas, new areas, you see, for them to learn. So you are absolutely right, Professor Shantakumar. I think we should be taking the lead by having not just a university like, uh, what is the Rajkumar University? Jinder. Yeah, Jinder. I think improvement upon that, where you would be teaching, you see, more about the uh, Indian laws. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. And uh, I think now it's time to open it up uh, for the audience. If, if any one of you have some questions to Dr. Please feel free. Is there anyone? Can you please raise your hand if anyone would want to ask a specific question? Fortunately, no one. Uh, sir, really uh, nice uh, thing we are learning from you. Sir, the good thing you are uh, talking, there is no need to change anything from the law and teacher. We are already good enough. But the question is there is a difference between what uh, national law school are doing and what traditional our uh, low colleges are doing, there is a big gap between that, as you are saying, the real education, legal education, and need of the general public. So, what is your view on those legal colleges uh, who are providing the legal education and what reform you are suggesting, particularly for them? See, Professor Madhav Menon made a remarkable uh, change. He brought about remarkable change when he set up the National Law School. Bangalore. That was a great achievement. It was followed then in other states also. But it is equally important to see the growth of private institutions which provide very high caliber, high, uh, highly competent uh, training uh, uh, legal education programs in the country. If I name some it won't be taken <coughs> by others, but I can tell you, Dr. Shashikala Kulpur is here. You see, Amity Group is there, Amity Group is there, and uh, there is the Shastra University, There's so many other universities and law schools which are doing a great job. So I don't see a difference. There may be a change, there may be a difference in the perception of the national law school and the private institution. But the end goal, the end result is they have the same thing. That to train the law students you see, to become familiar, not just with the laws that are in place in India, but with the changing situation globally, contemporaneously, all over the world. And that is what these institutions are doing in their own way. So we need not have, you see, a common program that oh, this will be the this will be applicable, and that is what I am going to suggest to Justice Amar Shah also that let there be autonomous application of the system of education, whether they are national law schools or they are the private institutions, which are doing a great job, you see, for the country and take the help of organizations like Manupatra for disseminating, you see what is happening. What, what does Manupatra do? It brings to you not just all the judgments which are delivered all over the country and which are cited in court, but it also brings to you whatever is happening globally, contemporaneously all over the world. And how now these new online courses, development of skills, that is another area which will be used, I'm sure, by the national law schools also and you see by the private institutions also. Therefore, we need not have any sort of uniformity in approach. It's the same thing, but the end result is very good, competent uh, law faculties and the law students who emerge from that. There is so much of demand by the law firms that whenever you see the uh, 
uh, final year students, they are about to, uh, there are uh, recruitment camps held there. Recruitment camps to take the best uh, students to see and to bring them into the fold of uh, uh, legal profession, whether as in-house counsel or as member of the law firm. Why is that fear? Because they have, you are involved with IBA, they have very strict ethical uh, orientation and uh, there are very strict ethical proceedings in their associations. Here, if a lawyer uh, misbehaves or does wrongful practice, they are kept outside Consumer Protection Act. In Ireland, first profession to be brought within Consumer Protection Act was legal profession. Whereas in our country, medical profession was brought in. I'm not saying one justifies the other. We don't have, I mean, ethics is celebrated more in violation than in compliance. Whereas uh, in foreign uh, jurisdictions, ethical inquiries are very seriously taken. So don't you think yeah. that and mobility is enhanced rather than reduced? That was my... Uh, there is no, I can say with some certainty, there is no mobility so mm -hmm. far as the foreign lawyers are concerned because they treat it as a business, you see. And what they do is just see the marketing they do for the profession in any state in the United States, on the television you will find someone saying, if you want a divorce, come to me, I am an expert in this, you see. If you have met with some accident, I am the ambulance chaser. I will get you the maximum compensation. Do we want to bring in that sort of a culture in India? In India we are prohibited. We can't even have our proper website. The Bar Council of India rules prohibit. Now the Supreme Court had to intervene, so what has been allowed is, okay, you can have a website, give your name and your area of practice and your address, contact detail, that's all. Whereas they can bring in, you see, they can have their brochures brought in, who are the experts in different areas in their firm, what achievements they have done, what deals they have done, million dollars, billion dollars and all those things. We can't do that. In India, we can't have contingency fee. What's they can it? have contingency fee. Uh -huh. I and they are, not, they are not, you see, subject to Bar Council of India disciplinary rules. If you have had a look at the BCI rules which have been framed, if some foreign lawyer commits a misconduct what we consider misconduct in India, he cannot be tried by the Bar Council of India, he will be tried by the law of his jurisdiction. And that jurisdiction will permit such things you see, to happen. So where is that parity, where is that nobility, where is that thing? Our profession, so far as our uh, heritage, culture, everything is concerned, that will be threatened, that will be threatened. My, my uh, concern comes from the fact that uh, isn't it uh, the time for us when 65% of the youth is mature now, it is going to leave this country soon, so uh, take over the major operations. So uh, something like legal tech when it comes and legal tech startups are already emerging and aggregation of legal services in terms of not practicing but providing information at least. Because what a hypocrisy it is. Right? On the one hand, as part of right to life, we and as part of so freedom of speech and expression, we acknowledge the right to know, we acknowledge the right to information, and as on the other side, in the name of sacrosanct restrictions of the profession, we restrict the awareness. Finally, for the client's right to know, citizen's right to know, shouldn't the lawyer's expertise be not advertised but communicated? So I that think 1961 rules need to be revisited in the light of so many constitutional developments. Yeah, they need to be revisited. Yeah, yeah. that's what I feel, sir. That is what, absolutely a correct observation and we have been telling, you see the past option, these rules need to be revisited and what they consider as advertisement. That is not advertisement at all. That is a dissemination of information. Supposing some lawyer in Kanpur, in Cape Town, he wants a lawyer in Kanpur. Yes. Now, he has got no access to the no outside access, yeah. So, there should be, that's what we have been pleading with the Bar Council. That information should be available. Yes. And at the moment, what we do, suppose
having some client of mine wants to make an investment in in the UK. So I can only advise him on the Indian law. I cannot advise him on the UK law. Therefore, what I tell him is, okay, these are a few law firms whom I know because of my uh, and most of the law firms have international connections through the uh, institutions like the International Bar Association, Union International, Des Avocat, the Law Asia, the Pacific. So we know who are the law firms dealing with which we. So we refer it, you see, our client to you select any one of them and do it. That is what we are doing. But Therefore, how many people know that SILF provides or your uh, Lalipasin and uh, Associates provides such facility? Because they will go to any random lawyer and they may not have the know-how which you have. That and also, sir, mentioned that uh, yeah. only he will provide that only to his clients, <laughs> not to the common people. So I think, uh, sir, it's high time that uh, we conclude and uh, say thanks to you for all of your support, always uh, your uh, support and blessings, not only to GNNB, to all the law schools across the country, I have been uh, seeing you moving around, happily participating on or in all these kind of academic deliberations. So, uh, GNNB, sir, on behalf of GNNB and Manupatra, uh, our heartfelt gratitude to you, sir, for your time and uh, efforts. Thank you, sir. You see, for me, it is always, as I say, it is a learning experience to come to any law school. Because, as I say, after 61 years in the profession, having seen all the changes which have taken place from the time when we used to have the big black <coughs> telephone and we were dialing you see, those numbers and all that to the mobile phone which we have, which provide all the data. It is a remarkable change which we have seen and which helps in dissemination, connectivity. It has been connectivity, which is very relevant. So, my idea of having a good tool, technological tool is to ensure connectivity. And when I come to a law school, I get connected, you see, with the faculty members, with the law students, and to learn from them as to what has been their experience that during the last few years, what is their vision for future so far as legal education or legal profession is concerned. Therefore, it is always like a continuing legal education for me. So for that, I thank Manupatra, I thank Professor Chanta Kumar, I thank all the faculty members. Thank you.